we stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength we bow down and worship him now how great how awesome is he together we sing everyone sing holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord. God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. And the earth is filled with His glory. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and we worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. Together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. And the earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. It's all around, it's the anthem of the Lord's renown, and it's rising up. It's all around, it's the anthem of the Lord's renown. And together we sing, let everyone sing. glory holy is the lord god almighty the earth is filled with his glory holy is the lord god almighty the earth is filled with his glory holy is the lord god almighty the earth is filled You make beautiful things, 
You make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of us. Living 
you speak, when you move, when you do what only you can do. It changes us, changes what we see, what we seek. When you come in the room, when you do what only you can do. It changes us, changes what we see, what we seek. When you speak, when you move, when you do what only you can do, it changes us, it changes what we see, what we seek. When you come in the room, when you do what only you can do, it changes us, changes what we see, what we seek. Seated above, throned in the Father's love, destined to die, and poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, the perfect and spotless One. He never sinned, but suffered as if he did. All authority, every victory. Power in hand, speaking the Father's plan. You're sending us out, a light in this broken land. All authority, every victory.
we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony everyone overcome we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony everyone overcome we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony everyone overcome Savior worthy of honor and Worthy of all our praise, you overcame. Jesus, awesome and power forever, awesome and great is your name. You overcame. Say. Jesus, Jesus, awesome and power forever, awesome and great is your name, you overcame. This is lesson number H in, in the book of Numbers will be in chapter 22. You're now to say through 25, but it's going to be 22 through 24. Uh, man, I, I found some stuff in chapter 25. and, and uh, I'm a, I'm, It's one of the places where I'm, I'm really excited. I'll almost skip over today and just run right there. So I, I'm anxious for next week to get here. You should read ahead into chapter 25. There's... Some big stuff there, and uh, you know, I'm excited when God shows me this stuff. So we'll start today in Numbers chapter 22, and uh, you know, from from the first book of Genesis up to this point, God has showed us really what He had been doing to redeem man from sin, and he, He's shown us from the context of the pure bloodline. Uh, which, as we know, became the Hebrew people, which eventually became the nation of Israel. And I, I tell you, I, I tell you that because we're at a different point today in, in the Bible. And I say different point because up to this up to this place in time, it has been from the perspective of the pure bloodline from the Hebrew people from Israel. You get to verse 22 and something changes for the first time. For the first time, the narrative goes to the perspective of the pagan people. We see, we'll see a conversation between pagans and who, are, who are overlooking Israel, who are outside of Israel. So that, that's a little different in this, in this chapter. Uh, specifically, you know, these chapters deal with a, a fellow named Balaam, and we all, I think most of us have heard the story about Balaam and the talking mule, talking donkey. And, and so, uh, you know, children are presented with this story because it's one of those places that's easy to uh, draw pictures and, and make, a, make a memorable story of, but I don't know if people always understand what's going on, so we'll look at it today. And Balaam, Balaam is a type He's a type that we should see, and, and we will see that he's a type. He's a representative of something else in life, and we'll see it today. And I think it's important. I think God wants us to see that because there is more written about Balaam in the Bible than there is written about the Virgin Mary. That's significant, I would say. There's more written about Balaam than there is of any of the apostles, more text given more mentions throughout the Bible. It's not just here. He's mentioned even into the New Testament. 
Matter of fact, he's, he's mentioned 59 times in Scripture. And so this is more than just a, a story that we can easily convert into a child's tale. This is important. God got some stuff for us here. So as we open chapter 22, uh, we, we find that Israel, you know, they've, they've, been, they've been wandering in the wilderness and they're headed again towards the end of the 40 years of wandering and they've entered into the land of Moab, which is just on the opposite side of the Jordan River from the Promised Land. Uh, so, so they're just across the river, pretty much. So they camp there, and, and seeing millions of, of foreign people in his land, the king of Moab, a, a name, man named Balak, he gets pretty concerned, and I, I think rightfully so. If you have in excess of two million people move into your land and set up camp uh, with, within a strong, stone's throw of your own, uh, that's reason for concern. So... He was concerned that they were about to be overthrown, that these Israelites were going to, to uh, put them under the sword eventually. So he sent word to this man named Balaam. And this Balaam had a reputation of being able to successfully cast spells, be they good spells or bad spells. He had a reputation of being able, he's a, he's a guy you can go to. He, you want somebody to have good luck you can go to Balaam. If you want somebody to be cursed you can go to Balaam. He's the guy that can do it. It's interesting uh, in, in verse 6 of chapter 22 King Balak tells his messengers to uh, tell Balaam words of his reputation. And the words that he tells them are, are whom thou blessest is blessed and whom thou cursedest is cursed. And and that's pretty interesting because there's only one who fits that description. And that one is, is Jehovah God. But they, they, this is the way they thought of Balaam, that he had these kind of powers. It's interesting because that's exactly the promise that God gave to Abraham some 600 years earlier, speaking of his descendants. In Genesis 12, 3, God said, And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. So this is... Again, this is what these people, these pagan people thought of the powers of this Balaam, this false prophet Balaam. So, so King Balak sent, mess, sent word by way of his messengers to, uh, to Balaam saying, if you will come and curse Israel, uh, there'll be good reward for you. I, I need to come and put a curse on these people before they conquer us. And, and if you read, if you're reading it, he sent words specifically to Balaam that the people who had come out of Egypt, and I think that's interesting that this is near 40 years later, and the people in this general area still knew who Israel was. They still were aware that these were the people that God had released from Egyptian slavery. But there was over 2 million of them. Uh, they moved into my backyard, and that's that's a big problem. Uh, you, know, you think about it, things don't change much, do they? You look at the Middle East today, what's the big problem? The big problem is the Israelites are in their backyard, and they don't want them there. Things things haven't changed much in a lot of years. So, so King Balak insisted that, that Balaam come to him at once to place a curse on Israel. So we should know, as we think about this and as we study it, who exactly is this Balaam? Well, Balaam was a, exactly, he was a pagan priest uh, who was living along, alongside the Euphrates River. Uh, as, as I said, he was known for being able to pronounce curses. And what's that mean? What's that mean that he was successful in pronouncing curses? It means that he was talking to demonic powers. He was talking to the demons in the area who were being worshipped as false gods. And, and, and as he would call on them, he was accessing their power. And, and there are people in the world who do such things today. More specifically, he was a pagan guy that God was about to use to the benefit of Israel. Even though nobody involved knew that's where this was going to go. God was about to use this guy. God can use who he will. So Balaam received these messengers from King Balak, and the first thing he did was is, is he invited them to spend the night there. He, 
wanted to consult Jehovah. Now, now, we've already seen that these people knew. They knew who Israel was. They, they knew their history over at least the past 40 years from their being freed of, of Egypt. Uh, they, they knew how God had taken Israel to the very border of the promised land once before, the, the same area they are. And they would have known that Israel balked at entering, that they, they would not enter. And so God had kept them in the wilderness for 40 years. And, and, and it's interesting that, that this Balaam says, you guys spend the night here. I want to consult with Yahweh. Now, that, right here, this is confusing to people. Christians read this and they say this, this man's a prophet. He's consulting with Yahweh. He's consulting with God. and So he, he must be a godly prophet. Well, hold on to that. Just, just keep that. But it's not true, but I want you to remember that a little bit. So who was Balaam? If he wasn't a godly prophet, but he was, he was going to consult with Yahweh, who was he? Well, he was an opportunist. He was, he was looking for his own prophet. He was in it for monetary gain. And he was a man who would consult with any spiritual authority that would speak to him. If he thought that the Israelites had a God named Yahweh, he was certainly willing to speak to this Yahweh. He, and he didn't see Yahweh as any different than any of the false gods that he routinely talked to. But he, he also has seen some things. This, he, knew, he would have known that this God of these Israelites, as Yahweh, he had some power. He knew how these people were free from Egypt. He knew how he manifested himself over their camp by day and night. He knew Yahweh had some power. So I, I have, as we look at this, I have no doubt that on this night as the messengers slept, that this Balaam indeed called on the God of Israel. I had no doubt in that because he was an opportunist. He was looking for monetary gain. And it's because God was shepherding these people to eventually deliver Jesus Christ as our kinsman, the Redeemer, that God not only answered this pagan on this night, but he would use this pagan. You know, we, when we think of God, we don't think of him using unbelievers, but sometimes he uses unbelievers. So that night, as, as Balaam uh, consulted with Yahweh, as he called on Yahweh, uh, God specifically told Balaam not to go to the Moabites. Not to go and curse Israel because he'd blessed Israel. God warned Balaam, don't go curse people I've blessed. So Balaam listened. He listened and he refused to go with the Moabites. So these messengers, they returned home to King Balak, the king of, the, of Moab, and he, they, they told the king that, well, he re, he refused to come. We, we offered him payment. He would not come. So the king sent some more representatives, messengers that were even more prominent, more important than the first ones. This time he, he sent a different offer. He didn't, he didn't offer a specific payment. He said, tell Balaam we will pay him whatever he names if he'll come and curse these Israelites. In Numbers 22, 20, it says, And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now right here is one of those places where those who are against God and against the Bible will contend that the Bible is full of contradictions or perhaps that God is wishy-washy and he's unfair that he told this man that he could go and as soon as he went, God was mad. All in the same sentence. And people say, look at that. How can, how can this Bible be dependable? How, how can you worship a God that would, 
would release a man to go, and as soon as he went, he, he was angry about it. Not only was he angry, he was going to stop this man, even if it meant killing him. That seems so unfair. And this is one of those places where it's good to look at and learn how carefully you have to consider what is written. That you should see how carefully the Bible has been written and understand there is no sloppy language. As I tell you over and over and over, there's no sloppy language in the Bible. And God does not waste words. And if he doesn't waste words, that means every word in the Bible has significance. And I've told you that before. And this is one of the cases you can see it. Do you remember just last week, if you were here, how Moses was denied entry into the promised land because he did not pay specific attention to what God had said. God told him to speak to the rock, and he went and he spoke to the people, and he struck the rock. That's not what God said to do. He was disobedient. He didn't pay attention to the detail of what God said. Well, Balaam did the exact same thing and not paying attention to the detail of what God said. He heard what he wanted to hear. And I think sometimes we need to slow down and listen to God. We need to read our Bibles. We need to slow down and, and see what we are reading. There's a two-letter word. If you have your Bible open, there's a two-letter word in verse 20 that's critical. God told Balaam, if, if the men call, they rise up and go with them. See the context. Catch it. God was saying to Balaam, if before you rise, the visitors call you, get up and go with them. But what did Balaam do? It's there in verse 21. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princess. Do you see where they called to him? What Balaam did was he rose as soon as dawn came, as soon as there was daylight, he got up into this excitement. He saddled his ass and he probably woke up the men. And I'm speculating a little bit, but I bet in the excitement, he woke the other guys up and said, let's get going. I got release from God, from this Yahweh of the Israelites. He said, I can go with you. Let's go. Well, that's not what God told him. There's no conflict here. God's not wishy-washy. Balaam was disobedient to what God said. Do you see that? Again, God told Moses to speak to the rock in chapter 20, and Moses struck the rock. God told Balaam to go with the men if they called to him, and they didn't. He was excited. He didn't wait for anyone to call. He got up and, and started out. I tell you, we cannot afford to only hear what we want God to say. There are an awful lot of people in the world who only hear what they want God to say when he hadn't even said that. We, it can't be our way. It has to be God's way. And if you're busy all the time thinking about what you want, what your desires are, you'll hear God say what you want him to say. You'll put words into his mouth. And we see the disaster that it brings. In, in verse 18, Balaam had said if, if to the messengers, well, let me back up. God put a test in front of this man. He put an absolute test in front of Balaam. He referred to God as my God. My God. There in verse 18 it says, if Balak would give me his house, Balaam speaking, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do more or less. Well, he's, he's, he's really making some big claims there. Do you, do you see what God's do, doing here? He's, he's going to use Balaam's own words to expose him for who he was. God did. He just did. 
Balaam had said that, but he, he claimed to be obedient to the word of God. But the next morning, just as soon as the sun came up, he ignored everything God said. Or, or twisted it into what he wanted God to say. Balaam ignored the conditions that God set up in his eagerness, eagerness for getting monetary gain for himself. There's a trap we need to avoid. There's a trap we need to avoid at all costs, that we not get so desirous of monetary gain or material gain for ourselves that, that we twist what God says. Do you ever do what Balaam did? Do you ever claim obedience to God? Or have you known anyone who has claimed obedience to God but as soon as an opportunity for monetary or financial, or I'm sorry, material gain comes, God seems to be forgotten. And I'll tell you what, you do well if you, if you stop often and think about your situation in the context of God. But Balaam was even caught in another life. It's also there in verse 18. I don't know if you saw it. He said, if, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not go beyond the word of the Lord. That was a lie. He would go beyond. As soon as he thought he could go and get whatever payment he could claim from King Balak, he was excited. He was excited when the sun came up. Ready to get going. You know, how, do I, how do I know that? Am I speculating that? No. Like I told you. Balaam's name is mentioned several times in the Bible. In Jude, verse 11, it says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and listen, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. That he ran to Moab greedily for reward. So that's why God was angered, even though he said, if, if these men call to you, you, you can go. But, but the men didn't call, and, and Balaam went anyway, so he was disobedient. So this is what aroused God's anger, because Balaam heard what he wanted to hear. And that's a human condition, that we tend to want to hear, or we tend to hear what we want to hear. We need to stop and listen to what God is saying. Balaam because that's what he wanted. He assumed that he had been released by God to go to Moab. And God's response was to send in his angel to confront Balaam for his error and warn him of impending doom. And as you see this, you should not only see the severity of God's judgment, but you should see his grace. The two go hand in hand. They're always next to each other. And his grace is, is shown there because if Balaam had attempted to curse what God had blessed, he would have been struck down. So you see grace in God stopping him. It was an act of grace. Well, along the way, the angel of the Lord was blocking the path and the ass that Balaam was riding could... They got to the point that Ash could see the angel, but Balaam could not. He's spiritually dead. And three times the donkey faltered and moved to the side and crushed Balaam's leg against the rocks or whatever happened to him. And Balaam became angry and beat the animal. And in verse 22 it says, And God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he's riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and a sword drawn in his hand, and the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or the left. 
And when they asked all the angels of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said to Balaam, Why, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said to the ass, Because thou hast mocked me. I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. And the ass said to Balaam, Am I not thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since thine was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. You know, I, I think people get so hung up that God was going to possibly kill Balaam here that they missed the extreme grace that God showed this man. Grace in, in sending an, his angel to stop him, but even so much grace to provide an ass the opportunity, the, the ability to speak. Verse 31 says, Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, he saw the angel, the Lord standing in the way, his sword drawn in his hand. He bowed down his hand, head and fell flat on his face, and I bet he did. Now, you're, you're good Bible students. Let me ask, when you read this, who is the angel of the Lord? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus standing in the way. So Jesus told Balaam, that I would have killed you in order to stop you, but the donkey spared your life. And verse 34 it says, And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stood in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displease thee, I will get me back again. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word which I shall speak to thee, that shalt thou speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Now, I would ask you here, do you think God had his attention? I think God had this man's attention. So when Balaam arrived in, in Moab, he told King Balak that he could only speak what Jehovah God of Israel or the, or the angel of the Lord would give him release to speak. So... Following the pagan ways, King Balak, it says, made an offering of oxen sheep to, to the pagan gods, and, and then he provided the meat of the offered animals to Balaam and the, and the men who had traveled with him. Uh, the, the next, very next day, King Balak took Balaam up to a high place, up uh, somewhere in a mountain, a place called Bamoth Baal. And from that high vantage point, they were looking over the, the Israelite camp with seen two million people camped there. And King Balak told Balaam to curse the Israelites. That's in verse 41. So, you know, this Balaam, he's a he's a he's a seer. He's a he's a false prophet. He's a guy with curses. He's a guy in, in his day what they would have done is they would Oftentimes they would get the liver of an animal and they would jiggle the liver and see how it jiggled and how it shined and that would give them an answer. So my point is that there is lots of pomp and circumstances with what they did. So to, to prepare to, to uh, speak over Israel, uh, Balaam, it says Balaam offered 14 sacrifices on, on seven altars and he, he consulted in, with God again. And then he went back to King Balak and, and he uh, proclaimed the message that God had given him. And it's there in chapter 23, verse 8. He said, how, how sh Balaam speaking to King Balak, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom God has not defied? From the, tops of, up, from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. That was a blessing. He spoke a blessing over Israel. Well, of course, that angered old King Balak. and He was not going to be dissuaded because he thought his future uh, depended on doing something about Israel. So, as you, as you read the story, King Balak took Balaam to, to two more high places, high places overlooking the camp of Israel. 
and, and, and instructed ba Balaam to pronounce a curse over these Israelites like I told you to. And each time, God placed blessings in the mouth of Balaam, prophecies that Balaam was prophesying over Israel. Now, now stop for just a moment and, and, and find the scene in your own mind's eye. Find what he was seeing, and what Balaam was seeing as he was taken to these high points overlooking Israel, the camp of Israel. We've looked at what the camp of Israel looked like. He saw, he saw the Israelites camped around the tabernacle in an encampment shaped like a cross. He saw people that God had blessed. And he learned that it's impossible to curse what God has blessed. To do so would be suggest that you could overpower God, and you can't. And that's what the world is finding out with Israel. It's impossible to curse, even today, what God is blessing. So, so at these three high points, Balaam prophesied blessings over Israel three times. And it infuriated, it infuriated King Balak. In verse, I'm sorry, in chapter 24, verse 10, it says, and he smote his hands together. He's angry. And Balak said to Balaam, I called thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them three times. Therefore now flee to thy place. He was angry. He's saying, you better get out of here before I have your head. It's interesting. He also told uh, told Balaam that, by the way, you're not getting paid either, and you can blame this Jehovah God you're talking to. Blame him for your trouble. At verse 24, verse 11, it says, I thought to promote thee to great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. It's God's fault. I'm not going to pay you a red cent. It's God's fault. You blame him. And then it says, before, before Balaam left, he reminded the king, and, and, and see right here, note right here, after King Balak was angry, there was a continuing bit of conversation. As, as Balaam reminds the king, look, I, I told you from the very beginning that I can only say what Jehovah releases me to say. And it's interesting that it took the grace of God to, to make Balaam's words true because that's not who Balaam was. That God had control of him. And not only did God have control of him, but he then gave Balaam four more prophecies to speak over Israel. Here, King Balak, you can have these free of charge. There's no need to pay for these either. At 24, verse 17, it says, I shall see him, but in this fourth one, this is the fourth one, it makes seven total, and it speaks directly of Jesus. I shall see him, but but not now I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Seth. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remains of the city. So King Balak sent for Balaam to curse Israel. Instead, seven times he pronounced blessing over them. He prophesied over them. And because he was prophesying over Israel, in effect, God's, I'm sorry, Israel's enemies were being cursed. The, the Moabites were being cursed because Israel was being blessed. In verse 25, it says, And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. Now, now we'll see later on, when we get to chapter 31, that in this ending conversation, uh, that Balaam actually figured out a way to get paid. He figured out how to get his reward from King Balak. And he, he figured out by giving advice that Balaam advised the Moabites to entice the men of Israel with, with their women and idolatry. And that if, if they could get the Israelite men to go whoring after the women and, and accept, start worshiping their false gods and their idols, that Israel would be cursing themselves. They'd be bringing a curse upon themselves. And and as you get to chapter 31, you'll see that King Balak took Balaam's advice, and Balaam is directly uh, given credit for doing this in, in the Bible. 
So, because eventually they do this, because uh, Israel will face a plague, they will bring cursing on a curse upon themselves. Twenty-four thousand men will die. So Balaam's name and story, they, they became famous. They're famous in the Bible. There's so much written about them, but not in a way that Balaam would have desired. In the New Testament, Peter in 2 Peter 2.15 compares false teachers to Balaam who love the wages of wickedness. And I told you earlier that Balaam presents to us a type. And I told you to remember that. And, and this is what I want you to see. That he was a type. He's a type that still lives today. That there are many people who work in, in ministry who serve God who are in it to promote their own pocketbook. They're false teachers. They'll tell the people what they want to hear. They don't have to hear God tell them what they want to hear. they got pastors who will tell them what they want to hear. They have their own Balaams. Jude, again, Jude uh, echoes that sentiment associating Balaam with selling one's soul for financial gain. Again, in verse 11. And Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ spoke specifically of Balaam when he talked to the Perch of Pergamon about their sin in the Revelation 2.14. Jesus said, there are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Jesus talking to the church. So in all this, we see that Satan's tactics haven't changed much. They haven't changed at all. He will try to open your back door to get you to curse yourself if you allow him to. He'll try to get you to curse yourself. He'll try to get you to voluntarily be crosswise with God. In idolatry, and sexual immorality are still his primary weapons. His primary tools of doing that. So what are you lusting after? Who or what are you worshiping? If you say anything but God, you need to get rid of that. You need to deal with that. You need to do what Joseph did when he was faced with Potiphar's wife. He ran. He ran. Boy, we, we, in Sunday school, we, we've been studying in Proverbs. And in chapter 7 of Proverbs, we, we look at a story about what King Solomon saw. The scene play out where this adulterous, this married woman trying to seduce a young a young, foolish man, naive. Suddenly, suddenly, he cursed himself. He cursed himself by falling for it. And if only he had run. If only he had run. So, so, again, and when we get to chapter 31, Moses will tell us exactly what happened, excuse me, what happened with, with the uh, Israelites cursing themselves. You know, even though Balaam didn't directly curse him, he he secretly pulled King Balak aside and, and told him how to get the Israelites to curse themselves. You know, I, th I think Balaam knew something about God. I think he knew God was a jealous God. I think I think he knew enough about God that he knew that if these Israelites, if you can convince them to openly sin against God, that God is just and he will have to judge them. So that's what Balaam told King Balak to do. Again, as we get to chapter 31, we will we'll read about that. So again, ba Balaam is a type. He's a type of person who who feigns to worship God, but they're doing it for financial gain. And I'm not just talking about pastors. There are an awful lot of people in church for who I can impress, who I can rub elbows with, who I can, who I can 
associate with, whose name I can drop, all for my own self-promotion. They're never dropping God's name. Yeah, I go to, I go to church. I go to the, to, to Big Deal Church with Big Deal people. I rub elbows with Judge So and So and Lawyer Who is Who, and but they never mention God. And that's a problem. That's a Balaam. That's a Balaam problem. And it's a Balaam problem if you are looking for God to tell you something and you want to do answer A so bad that at the first hint of anything you say, this is God's will. I'm doing this because God wants me to. Now, Balaam got up so early in the morning because he was just sure God told me he could go. He forgot if. forgot if. Why did God give the ass the ability to speak? And I, I think the answer to that is because Balaam was so intent. He's so intent to get to Moab to get any price he could name, to be rich. That God had to do something unusual and profound to get him to stop and get his attention. And I hope that God never has to do anything unusual or profound to get our attention. That we're just naturally paying attention to him. That that's our desire of a place to be. Let's let's pray as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, boy, if, if there's any piece of Balaam in any of us, I, w- I would ask that your Holy Spirit would begin to root that out. That we desire you more than fine silver and gold. That we we just know that in you is everything we could and should desire. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for giving us insight into what has happened, all the things that you've done to bring Jesus Christ to us, and we're thankful for him. Father, let us go out into the world. Let us be a people who speaks often of Jesus Christ. In his name we are, in his name we pray.